what if there was a dedicated workspace at the end of your road? A space you shared with family, friends, and neighbors. A creative atmosphere without office politics. What if there were yoga classes, peer support groups, and mentoring? And an on-site daycare center supported parents of young children. And what if everyone had access to this space as a public good, making it central to local life, reviving relationships, and boosting businesses? When we think about the infrastructure that brings us together, parks, libraries, pubs, is it time to add community workspaces to that list? Now, at this point, you might be thinking, who is this nutter, and what is he rambling on about? Community work what? How and why is this realistic, relevant, and needed? Good question. Well, hola, soy Ben. And my proposal is that community workspaces hold the key to a more inclusive and healthy future of work. And I believe that we have an urgent, once-in-a-generation opportunity right now to make them a reality for local areas across the land. You see, the pandemic triggered the great remote work experiment. And despite what certain billionaires and politicians say, the workforce is never going back to the way that it was. A staggering 97% of employees want their work to be at least partially remote in the future. Why? We want freedom and autonomy. We need a lower cost of living and more time to spend with loved ones. It's not rocket science. Remote work can also bring back the millions of people who are currently locked out of employment. They include parents, carers, people with mental and physical impairments, and refugees basically anybody for whom the traditional nine-to-five office model is exclusionary. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, employment of people with disabilities has surged to a record high amid remote work policies. This is the impact of the remote work revolution, which unfortunately, some people in positions of power have simply failed to grasp. However, even a remote work geek like me has to acknowledge that there are some very serious problems with the way things are heading. Think about it. This is the greatest disruption to working patterns since World War II, a change that was expected to unfold over multiple decades happened in a couple of years. Of course, there were going to be growing pains. And one of the greatest challenges to emerge from the unprecedented speed at which remote working exploded over the past three years is loneliness. Several studies, including our own research, have found loneliness to be one of the biggest problems faced by those who work from home. What is really troubling about that is research has linked social isolation and loneliness to higher risks for a variety of physical and mental conditions. They include high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, and Alzheimer's disease. Here's the thing, though. It's not a new problem by any stretch of the imagination. Data from the General Social Survey revealed that from 1985 to 2004, the proportion of people who reported having no one to discuss important matters with nearly tripled. Something at the heart of our culture has been driving this disconnection for a long time, long before our lives were drenched by the blue light of screens. But now these technologies the miracles that are enabling global access to education and employment 
could take it to a whole other level. I was struck by something Brian Chesky, CEO of Airbnb, said at a conference. He said, the mall is Amazon, the theater is Netflix, the office is Zoom. There's a future where you never leave your home, and after COVID is over, the most dangerous thing will be loneliness. I know, living in London, a place that's cold in more ways than one, what it's like to be surrounded by literally millions of people and to yet feel completely alone. I mean, what is going on there, right? So if we want to avoid this dystopia of disconnection that we are sleepwalking into, maybe we need to approach this whole remote work thing differently. Maybe it's not about home versus office, as the media likes to fixate on. Maybe it's about a viable alternative to both of them, one that provides connection and a sense of belonging high-quality infrastructure and opportunities for skills development without forcing us to sacrifice the life-changing flexibility and accessibility of working from home. This is where community workspaces come in. Pre-pandemic, most people had never imagined a world where co-working was a truly mainstream activity. As a result, its potential for the workforce and society at large is vastly underestimated, if not completely unexplored. I'm not talking about WeWork, okay? I'm talking about an entirely new kind of social and cultural infrastructure. And now that the pandemic has demolished the barriers that were preventing remote work, and therefore co-working for many people, exciting possibilities are starting to emerge we could reimagine the workspace landscape as one fit for the remote work era. That's why, bringing it back to the beginning, this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. At this exact moment in history, we are all figuring out, in the realms of public policy, organizations, our personal lives, where and how work should get done. This is our chance to be a little bit imaginative. So what do I mean by community workspace? What makes this different from co-working 1.0? For now, I would like to put forward that a community workspace is a hyper-local shared work hub that incorporates these five principles into its design and management. The first principle is access, financially and geographically. Community workspaces must be available to everyone as a public good. If you can't afford a membership, and there is no support from the government or your employer to get one, or if the space is outside of a short distance from where you live, then this is not a community workspace. The second principle is community. Everything about the space from the way it's designed to the events and programming that take place inside the venue, should be carefully optimized based on the best science to foster meaningful social connections. Then we have well-being. As an extension of that, users are supported in cultivating a healthy and intentional relationship with technology, according to the latest evidence, while peer support groups and other forms of non-hierarchical networks of support help people maintain their mental, psychological, and emotional health. Then we have impact. The space is environmentally sustainable. It creates jobs in the local economy. And all kinds of volunteering and mentoring opportunities are available. It's particularly important that we use these hubs to transfer the knowledge of their users across the local community in order to address the digital divide in skills and infrastructure that has been highlighted over the past three years. In Ireland, they're talking about a really cool initiative called Time Donation, where users of their co-working hubs will be empowered to use some of the time they've saved by avoiding the commute to lend their skills and knowledge to the local community. And the fifth 
and final principle that I would like to propose is collaboration. Collaboration between the users, but also the public and private sector. Imagine if every neighborhood, town, and village had one of these. The evidence suggests that this restructuring of where and how we work would combat loneliness by providing a space to meet and connect with our community, lower our cost of living due to the reduction of commuting and energy costs, supercharge skills through training and mentoring opportunities, tackle the burnout epidemic by providing a life work barrier, and even help to regenerate local areas by spreading spending power across a wider geographic sector. This, in my humble opinion, is remote work done the right way. And let me be clear, I love working from home. I can't overstate the power in the past when my health wasn't so great of being able to continue working when under normal circumstances, not being able to show up at an office would have meant game over. It is life-changing. There's also nothing wrong from wanting to work from an office, obviously. More power to you. This is simply about giving people options, especially those who need it. It's about true flexibility and choice. Now, if this sounds like a bit of a lofty vision from the so-called digital nomad, then let's ground this in reality with two tangible policies. First, governments, as a start, can fund the creation of community workspaces in rural and underserved communities. The Irish government, got to give another shout out to the Irish, invested 100 million euros in the development of remote working facilities in their towns and villages across the country. And the people there that I've spoken to on the ground have told me that this has helped retain talent in these areas, reversing brain drain. These measures could also include financial incentives for developers to convert and use buildings. In the UK, there's something like 600,000 buildings that are empty, not being used for anything. Repurposing these existing assets is a great way to ensure that everyone lives within an easy, walkable distance from a community workspace. Second, employers can provide monthly stipends to cover usage costs. And yes, that includes for their contractors and freelancers. In our research, 46% of workers would find stipends a high value to use co-working more. And by the way, companies like Spotify and HR tech unicorn Remote already offer this fundamental benefit. This is how we start to update the old operating system of hyper-centralized offices, lonely homeworking, and expensive co-working memberships. In our increasingly atomized and individualistic culture, the age-old concept of the community hub has varying degrees of success. It always comes down to funding, or lack thereof. So maybe we needed this perfect storm of the pandemic and digitization and the untapped concept of co-working to put forward a model that can secure the necessary public and private sector investment for it to take off in a big way. A community workspace boosts jobs, skills, and innovation. Workers are happier and healthier, which we know boosts productivity. These are tangible benefits, ensuring a positive return on investment. And for those of us who are less interested in seeing things in that way, we get a space to make new friends and to be useful for our communities. In conclusion, I promised my sister 10 minutes, and I'm certain I've gone way over. I am really tired of the public conversation around remote work being fixed on a home versus office narrative. The lack of imagination engendered by this fixation hinders us from developing and harnessing alternatives to traditional office space in a way that benefits our relationships, well-being, and local communities. The pandemic, with all its horrors, 
has also created a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rewrite the rules and positively reimagine a future of work that might actually work for everyone. When the first dedicated office buildings are created, several hundred years ago, the most popular mode of transportation was the stagecoach. Surely, in 2023 and beyond, there is a more sophisticated way to do workspaces too. Instead of organizing our entire lives around where our employer's office happens to be, we could be working alongside our family, friends, and neighbors, all just a short stroll away from home. The needs of workers, employers, and governments are all aligned on this concept of community workspaces. Everyone benefits. I'll say it again, a community workspace boosts jobs, skills, and innovation. Workers are happier and healthier. So vamos. Or we could just force everyone back to the office full time. Thank you. <laughs>